You may be seated. Thank you so much. So I asked if I could stand down there, and he said no. I, suppose, I thought the guest was always right. Yeah, so I said, I'd be much, much more comfortable down there than I am up here. I'm going to, well, he wants me to do a five and ten minute deal, so we'll do a five and ten minute deal. Turn to, if you were to John chapter 13, years and years and years ago, I was ministering at a church, and after we got done, we went to lunch with the pastor and his wife, and we were talking, and uh, while we were talking at, at a high top, uh, we were at a high top table, and uh, uh, I saw the, the uh, pastor's wife pull out a napkin and put a bunch of dots on it, and after she put a bunch of dots on it, she said, uh, shoved it in front of me, and she said, uh, connect the dots. And uh, I looked at that little napkin, and, and, I, and I looked at it puzzled, and I said, well, I can't. She said, well, why can't you? I said, there's no numbers by the dots. And she said, that's what's happening in most churches today. We're putting this doctrine in front of people. We're putting this thought in front of people. We're putting this idea in front of people, this topic in front of people. And then we're saying, just connect the dots. And that, that struck a chord with me. Because I realize that it is my responsibility as a minister to connect the dots for you and to make sure that you understand exactly what, what, how this relates to this and how this, you know, affects this. And so we're going we're gonna to connect some dots today. Would that be all right? John chapter 13, Jesus um, suddenly uh, says these words and John writes about him in John chapter 13, verse 1. So, so like I said, we're going to go a little quickly. And so let me get my pad up here and get going here and we'll... We'll get going here. All right, here we go. You ready to go? All right. John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own, which were in the world, he loved them until the end. Supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went to God, he rises from supper, laid aside his garments, took a towel and girded himself. And after that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet. Jesus, in verse 1, notice what it says here. Now, before the feast of the Passover, underline this phrase. When Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world. Suddenly, Jesus became aware of the fact that his life was about to end. And I've thought about this a lot. If I suddenly realized and came to aware that my life was about to end, I know exactly what I'd do. I've actually thought about it. I'm going to pull my wife into the room, and I'm going to tell her everything she needs to know in order for, me to, in order for her to carry on after I'm gone. I'm going to pull my son and my daughter into the house, and I'm going to tell them exactly what they need to know in order, and, and remember in order for them to carry on after I'm gone. I'm going to pull my, my seven grandbabies I'm going to pull, well, before I get my grandbabies, I do have a daughter-in-law and a son-in-law that I'm going to pull in. <laughs> but when you get grandbabies, who cares about, never mind. And so, so the thing about it is, is um, you've got all these kids and all that you're going to pour into the life. Jesus suddenly became aware of the fact that his life was about to end. And Jesus turned his attention from that point on, from the public to the disciples. And he begins by washing their feet. And then if you have a red letter edition Bible, and I trust that you do, if you begin to turn in, Romans chapter, in John chapter 13, you'll begin to see that Jesus does a whole lot of teaching, a whole lot of talking to these disciples, because what he's doing is he's giving them the information that they will need in order for, him, for them to carry on after he is gone. John chapter 14, almost all read, it's the words of Jesus to the disciples. John chapter 15 all read. John chapter 16, all read. John chapter 17, all read. And at the end of John 17, he actually prays for them. He says, O righteous Father, verse 25, the world hath not known thee, but I have known thee. And these have known that thou hast sent me, that, and I have declared unto them thy name. And I will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. And the next few verses speaks of Judas and his betrayal of Jesus. Jesus poured into his disciples what they would need from John 13 to John 17, what they would need to know in order for them to carry on after he is gone. If you read these chapters very quickly, 
there's two topics that surface. The first topic that surfaces is the issue of love. John chapter 13, he's very clear that you love one another as I have loved you, implying that if you're going to be able to carry on after I'm gone, you're going to have to be a love specialist. You have to know something about the issue of love. He told them you cannot operate in the future without the issue of love and love toward one another. It's one thing to love the world. It's another thing to love one another. I found this out a long time ago. It's real easy to love people you don't know. You can walk in love toward people that are in Walmart all day long, open doors for them and speak highly to them and be kind to them. But boy, you get in the house, you get in the apartment, things start deteriorating real quickly. And so he says that you love one another. The second subject that comes up to the surface when, he, when we talk about John 13 through John 17 is the Holy Spirit. He said, if you're going to be successful after I'm gone, you're going to have to be very familiar with the issue of love, and you're going to have to be very comfortable with walking with the Spirit of God in your life. And so I want you to notice here, and I want you to go with me, if you will, to John chapter 14, because these two issues, and I find it very interesting, if you know anything about Brother Hagin's ministry uh, before he passed away, he passed away in 2003. Uh, but, the, but the last four years, the last five years of his ministry, he ministered on almost everywhere he went on two subjects, walking in love and the Holy Spirit. I don't know if he understood what I've seen from John chapter 13 through John 17 or not, but nevertheless, that's how he ended his earthly his ministry. He ended it just like Jesus ended it, by talking about the love of God and the Holy Spirit in our lives. And I want you to notice here in John chapter 14, there's a scripture, somebody quoted it, I don't know if it's a worship leader or Chad, uh, quoted it, John chapter 14, I want you to turn with me you will, to verse 16, listen to what it says here. Jesus says these words to the disciples, who he just realized that he's, he's going to leave them, and he's going to, you know, walk away from them, but he assures them in John chapter 14, verse 16, that you are not going to be alone after I leave. You, as a believer, have never, have never been intended to walk alone in this life. He says, he says this way, and I will pray, verse chapter 14, verse 16, and I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another. And I'm sure that Pastor Ches talked about this word, another. It means after the same sort, after the same manner, another comforter. In other words, what he's simply saying here is, is what I have been to you, the Spirit of God will be to you. You will not be alone. In fact, if you look, at, if you look up that scripture in the Amplified Version, it says these words, John chapter uh, 14, if you will, in verse 16, it says these words, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, a counselor, a helper, an intercessor, an advocate, a strengthener, and stand by, that he may remain with you forever. As I'm meditating on getting prepared for this message today, the word helper stood out to me significantly, if you will. And I thought to myself, you know, I've worked with a lot of people that have had helpers that never really took advantage of the helpers that were supposed to be working with them. If you're not real careful, you'll find yourself trying to do life alone and independent. But the thing about it is, you've been given a helper. But you know as well as I do, if you've ever been in the helps ministries, it's sometimes hard to help people that you've been assigned to help when they won't let you help. A lot of times the Spirit of God is designed to be a helper to us. And yet so oftentimes, he's not allowed to be our helper because we never call on him. We never, we never tap into his abilities and tap into his strengths. I find that to be very interesting. But Jesus said, I will pray and I will give you another comforter that he may abide and live with you forever. You're not going to have to do the life alone. He, he, will, he will be with you. What I was to you, he will be to you. Now, I want you to notice here, he goes on to say these words in verse 17 of John 14. Even the, underline it, spirit of truth. Jesus called the Holy Ghost the spirit of truth. 
in John 14 in verse 17. Now go with me, if you will, to John chapter 15. John chapter 15 in verse 26. He's still talking about the Holy Spirit. But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the, underline it, Spirit of truth, he called him the spirit of truth in John 14, verse 17. He called him the spirit of truth in John 15, verse 26. Now go with me, if you would, to John 16. John 16, verse 13. Jesus is still speaking here, and he says these words. Howbeit when he, the spirit of truth, there it is again. Three times in a row, Jesus called the Holy Spirit the spirit of truth. Now, what will the Spirit of truth do when he comes? I want you to go with me, if you will, to John chapter 14. And I want to look this time in verse 26. What will the Spirit of truth do when he comes? John 14, verse 26, Jesus is speaking once again, but the Comforter, same subject, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name. Now, underline this next phrase. He shall teach you all things. The first thing that the Spirit of truth will do is teach you all things. Number two, also found in verse 26, and, underline it, bring all things to your remembrance. Jesus said that when the Spirit of God comes into your life, he will do two things. He will teach you, he will teach you all things, and he will bring all things to your remembrance. But there's two more. Go with me if you were to John 16. John 16, in verse 13, when this comforter comes, he's going to abide within you. He's going to be your helper, and he's going to help you by teaching you all things and by putting you in remembrance of all things. He's also going to help you, John 16, verse 13, Howbeit, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will underline it guide you into all truth. Underline that phrase. Not only will he teach me all things, not only will he remind me of things, but he will also guide me into all truth. There's one more. Let's keep reading. Verse 13. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he also speak. Underline it. And he will show you things to come. Jesus promised that when the Spirit of God would come, he would do four things. He was, he was going to guide you into all truth. He's going to teach you all things. He's going to remind you of things. And he's going to show you things to come. Now listen to me now very carefully. When Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit, he speaks more of him as a revealer of truth than a worker of miracles. Listen to me now very carefully. When Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit, he speaks of him more as a revealer of truth than a worker of miracles. What I find interesting is this, is that when you look at John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17, what he's teaching us is about the Holy Spirit in us. But there is an other side to the Holy Spirit, and that is talking about how the Holy Spirit will flow through us to others. So much of our charismatic movement has been so focused on the Spirit of God flowing through us. And hardly nothing's been mentioned at all how the Holy Spirit and what he will do in us. When he flows through you and I, he's flowing through you and I through what we refer to as the gifts of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Workings of miracles, gifts of healings. Um, the gift of faith, uh, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, uh, discerning of spirits. That is the Spirit of God flowing through you to touch others. But when he speaks of the Holy Spirit, in John chapter 13 through 17, he's not mentioned it one time about the Spirit of God flowing through us to minister to others. He's actually talking about solely focused on our understanding that he is working within us. And that is a revealer of truth. And just let me say this. The revealing of truth is as much of a move of God 
as a blind eye opened or an arm restored. For some reason, we focused, here again, in the charismatic community, we're all kind of focused about the workings of miracles and the gifts of healings and, the, and, and tongues interpretation and prophecy, and boy, we love when that stuff happens. But people have actually walked away from services where truth was revealed, where truth was unfolded, and yet they walked away thinking there wasn't any move of God at all because there wasn't a tongue or interpretation or a prophecy. And so the thing about it is, is we have to understand that it's as much of a move of the Spirit of God when He reveals the truth to us, and we should be as much as thrilled with that as we are the miracles that we so long for, or the prophecy, or the tongue of interpretation. He is the revealer of truth. Now, this thought came to me. I want you to go with me if you go to Galatians. I'm a hurrying. Trying my best. Galatians, Galatians chapter 5. Galatians 5. What will these truths produce within our lives if we will apply them? The things that he has taught us, the things that he has guided us into, the things that he's reminded us of, what will they produce? They will produce the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is not the result of some spiritual um, level that you have obtained to, to where all of a sudden these things just kind of flow out of you. These, these fruit of the Spirit are the, are the result, it's the fruit of the Spirit. What does the Spirit do? He teaches us, guides us into truth, He reminds us of things. And when you apply what you have been taught by the Spirit of God to your life, it will produce love toward one another, joy in the midst of peace, in the midst of long-suffering toward gentleness toward, goodness toward, faith, meekness, temperance. There's fruit that comes from what he has taught us. So if we are lacking the things of Galatians chapter 5 verses 12, I'm sorry, 22 and 23. If we're lacking those fruits of the Spirit, we need to ask ourselves the question, how much of the truths that I have received by the Spirit of God through the Word have I been applying to my life? Now, you know this, as well as I do, that we've got Him teaching us. And here again, let me just insert this for a second here. Jesus said he'll teach you all things, he'll remind you of things, he'll show you things, he'll guide you into all truth. Jesus said, I will send you another comforter after the same sort, after the same manner. What I have been to you, he will be to you. Isn't it true that Jesus taught the disciples and guided them into truth? Isn't it true that he reminded of things that they have been taught? Didn't he show them things to come? Didn't he guide them into all truth? The Spirit of God will do the exact same things in our lives that Jesus did in their lives. He will do the exact same thing. Now, you know, as when we talk about the Holy Spirit, there's a number of different areas here. We're talking about Him teaching us in this particular context. We're talking about over there in, in, um, in 1 Corinthians 12, the gifts of the Spirit. He flows through the gifts. But you know this also, that the Spirit of God will lead us in direction, give us direction. Go with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And as, like I said, I'm giving you the abbreviated version of this, so please bear with me. Acts chapter 16. Paul is on his second missionary journey, and uh, this is where that uh, in chapter 15, uh, chapter 15 of Acts, Paul goes up to Barnabas and says, uh, let's go up and check up on everybody, see how they're doing in Galatia. Uh, Antioch and Pisidia, Iconium, Lister, Derby. 
let's just go see how they do. Well, they went ahead, got up there and saw what they did, and they, did, they were doing fine. And so after they got done, uh, Paul said, well, where do we go to next? And so Paul said, uh, I tell you what, I've always had a desire to go to, to Asia. Let, let, let's go to Asia. They took a step toward Asia. Look at what it says here in Acts chapter 16 and verse 6. Now, when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, Galatia, once again, is Antioch, the city, Iconium, Lister, Derby, and were forbidden, watch this now, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. After, after they got done checking up on the people of Galatia, he took a step toward Asia, and the Spirit of God checked him about that, that, that inward witness, that, that hesitation. And so he thought, no, 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 we're not supposed to be going to Asia. So look at what happens in verse 7. And after they were come to Messiah, they essayed to go to Bithynia. Underline it. But the Spirit suffered them not. All of a sudden, he said, well, if we can't go to Asia, let's go to Bithynia. They took a step toward, toward, toward Bithynia, and the Spirit of God checked them again about it. Well, then they turned their, they turned their, their, their sights on Troas, and, and, and they went to Troas without any checks and hesitancies about it. I found this to be true. Most people today, when it comes to being led of the Lord, when it comes to being led for direction now, I'm talking about direction now. Most people, in my opinion, are doing it wrong. They're sitting in their prayer closets, hikimoshundine for like three or four hours a day, trying to figure out which, which direction to go and, and what decision to make. The, the, the Bible says the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. Yeah. It's a lot easier to direct a moving vessel than a stationary vessel, a docked vessel. And if you're just sitting in your closet, it's, well, you wonder what school we should send our middle schoolers to. Why not go ahead and take a step toward it and go, and go, and go, go take a tour of the middle school that you're thinking about sending your kids to? And as you take a step toward it, if you get any checks during that tour, if you get any hesitancy, well, then step back and say, well, I guess that wasn't the right way to go. Come on, guys. Yeah. And, and then you take another step toward another direction. And if you don't get any checks, in, you know, about that particular issue, well, then take the next step. You, you keep going until you, until, until you get a hesitancy. But if you don't get any hesitancy, well, then you, you keep going. So many individuals today, you know, jobs, investments. Uh, instead of just praying, waiting for something to drop in your, your heart out of the clear blue, why not go ahead and take a step toward that? I don't know about you, uh, cars are that way for me, houses are that way for me. You take a step toward it, no, no, that wasn't the right one. So you, get to, you got any more houses you can show us? No, that's not the right one. But all of a sudden, you, you settle in on the steps of a righteous man or order. The, he'll lead you and guide you. Isn't that right? But I want you to go with me, if you will. To, uh, John, to Romans chapter 8. I've been troubled by this passage for quite some time. We're talking about the Spirit of God in you. He will teach you, guide you. He will remind you. He will show you. Guys, can I just say this? If you're going to be a person of the Holy Spirit in today's world... You got to be teachable. Yeah. You have to have a, a listening heart, a teachable spirit. If you're one of these individuals that just know it all, and well, you're going to miss out on a whole lot that the Spirit of God is trying to get to you. Because He doesn't just overwhelm us and change our lives on His own, He has to do it with, it, with our cooperation. He's our helper. He's our helper. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Romans 8, verse 14. Very familiar passage to the majority of us. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. This question came to me while I was actually preparing for this message. I never have had asked myself this question before or these questions. The question is this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, where is the Spirit leading us 
from. And where is he leading us to? Say that again. If the Spirit of God is going to lead us, he's leading us away from something towards something. The context of chapter 8 is the context of a life changed by being governed by flesh to being influenced by the Spirit. This portion of Scripture speaks of a new way of living, no longer according to the flesh, but living in harmony with the Spirit. I'm going to go ahead and answer this, this question ahead of time, then I want to read verses 1 through 14. Where is the Spirit leading us away from? According to this passage, A, He's leading us away from sin and fulfilling the desires of the flesh. Number two, he's leading us away from things and behavior that are contrary to God's will. Where is the, leading, where is the Spirit of God leading us toward? Behavior that reflects the holiness of God and his righteousness. Now, before I read this in the Amplified Version, guys, can you pull this Amplified Version up, if you will, beginning with chapter uh, 8, verse 1? When the Spirit of God leads us, when we're looking for direction for our lives, man, we are excited to hear from Him. So thankful that He's given us direction. But in the context of this passage, this indicates to me that the Spirit of God will also check you about inappropriate behavior. And when he checks us about inappropriate behavior, we're not always really looking for his input. We're looking for his input when it comes to direction. What, school, what middle school do I send my kids? But when it comes to when it comes to inappropriate behavior, ungodliness, because below the standard of, of God in, in behavior and conduct and living, we're not always real keen to perk up and But the Spirit of God has been given to you to help you when you get off course, when it comes to his character, with his integrity, with his holiness. I want to read Amplified Version, Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 14. Listen to the context of this passage. Romans, 14, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 is not talking about which house to buy. It's not talking about which car to buy. It's not talking about, well, do I go to Africa or do I go to China? It doesn't talk about, it's not talking about that. It's talking about character. It's talking about holiness. It's talking about the desires of the flesh versus the life of the spirit. Let's go. Chapter 8, verse 1. Therefore, there is now no condemnation 
no adjudging guilty or of wrong for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, the law of our new being has freed me from the law of sin and death. A little confusing, we'll talk about it someday. For God, has not, for, for God has done what the law could not do, its power being weakened by the flesh, the entire nature of man without the Holy Spirit. Sending his own son in the guise of sinful flesh and as an offering for sin, God condemned sin in the flesh, subdued, overcame, deprived it of its power over all who accept that sacrifice. Verse 4. So that the righteous and the just requirement of the law might be fully met in us who live and move not in the ways of the flesh. Oh good, you got it up there. But in the ways of the spirit. Our lives governed not by the standards and according to the dictates of the flesh. But controlled by the Holy Spirit. For those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its unholy desires. Set their minds on and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds and on and seek those things which gratify the Spirit of God. Here again. You know what gratifies him by what truths he's revealed to you. Now, the mind of the flesh, which I like this. Does it say it that way up there for you? What's, uh, where are we at here? And it doesn't have the verses on there. Verse, uh, where am I at? Verse 5. For those who are according to the flesh are controlled by its, by its unholy desires. Set their minds and pursue those things which gratify the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit and are controlled by the desires of the Spirit set their minds and seek those things which gratify the Holy Spirit. Verse 6. Now the mind of the flesh which is in sense and reason without the Holy Spirit. The mind of the flesh doesn't, doesn't, doesn't have the the wisdom of the Spirit in it at all. And it's death. Death that comprises all the miseries arising from sin, both here and after, and hereafter. But the mind of the Holy Spirit is life and soul peace, both now and forever. That is, because the mind of the flesh, with its carnal thoughts and purposes, is hostile to God. For it does not submit itself to the law of God, indeed cannot. So then those who are living the life of the flesh, catering to the appetites and the impulses of the carnal nature, cannot please or satisfy God or be acceptable to him. But you are not living in the life of the flesh. You are living the life of the Spirit. If the Holy Spirit of God really dwells within you, directs and controls you by his by what he has revealed, by what he has taught you, by what he has showed you. But if anyone does not possess the Holy Spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and he does not belong to Christ, he is not truly a child of God. But if Christ lives in you, then although your natural body is dead by reason of sin and guilt, the Spirit is alive because of the righteousness that he imputes to you. And if the Spirit of him who raised up Jesus from the dead dwells in you, then he who raised up Christ Jesus from the dead will also restore to, you, to life your mortal, short-lived, perishable bodies through his Spirit who dwells within you. So then, brethren, we are debtors. I like this. We are debtors not to live according to the flesh, but we are to live a life ruled by the standards set up by the dictators and we are not to live by the standards set up by the dictates of the flesh. For if you live according to the dictates of the flesh, verse 13, you will surely die. But if through the power of the Holy Spirit, you are habitually putting to death, making extinct, deadening the evil deeds prompted by the body, you shall really and genuinely live forever. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are the sons of God. 
he is talking about in these verses a life that is led by the Spirit of God as he, as he, as he touches areas by his truths that we need to make adjustments in. Now, you know as well as I do, once again, that when flesh is in control, Galatians chapter 5, verses 19, talking about the works of the flesh, adultery, and fornication, and lasciviousness, and on, on down through the list, those will be produced. But if you follow what he has taught you, if you embrace what he has revealed to you, then those things will no longer be a part of your life. You'll be able to walk away from those things, live a life that is pleasing to the Lord, and live a life that is honoring to him. Now, I said all that to say this. This is my conclusion. I want you to turn with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because we have... These, 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 four, these four issues, him teaching us, guiding us, showing us, forewarning. We also have him flowing through us with the gifts of the Spirit. We also have him leading us when it comes to direction. But we also have him touching areas with his word, with the word of God, that we need to make adjustments in. I've said this for a long time. Anytime the Spirit of God touches you in an area in your life, what he's asking you to do is simply this. If you make this little bit of an adjustment, your life will be better. I'm going to say that again. Anytime the Spirit of God touches you through the Word about an area in your life, what He's telling you, if you make a little bit of an adjustment, your life will be better. Thank you. The Spirit of God will never, will never force you to make big adjustments. He'll always, he'll always make the step away from the area that he wants to move you away from with, with, with increments, with little steps. Doable, thank you, doable steps. But if you're not real careful when the Spirit of God touches an area that you really weren't wanting his input in, You'll find yourself guilty of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Turn with me, if you will, please. Verse 18. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God concerning, will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Verse 19. Underline it, the one word. Quench, not the Spirit. When the Spirit of God teaches you something, you have the ability to quench it. When the Spirit of God wants to flow through you to another person, you have the ability to quench it. When the Spirit of God checks a step you've taken toward an area, you have the ability to quench it. When the Spirit of God touches a the potty mouth or maybe not getting to work on time or maybe the way you're treating your spouse when he touches that with the word of God you have the ability to quench that the word quench the word quench means this in fact if you, it means to extinguish it means to suppress it means to stifle. Listen to this translation. Quench not the manifestation of the Spirit. Listen to this translation. Do not extinguish the Spirit's fire. Another translation. Do not stifle 
the voice of the Spirit. I use this example a lot. I have a match. Quench that. You all looking at me saying, well, you can't quench something that's not lit. And that's my point. You cannot quench something, you cannot quench the Holy Spirit before He manifests Himself. You cannot quench Him before He teaches you something. You cannot quench Him before, before you take a step. You cannot quench Him before He addresses something in your life that needs to be addressed. You cannot quench the Spirit of God before He but once he ignites himself in your life. Anytime a match is lit, it is lit to make a change. Bring warmth, cook. And so when the Spirit of God, the moment he, the moment he speaks into our lives, the moment he shows us something that needs to that needs to change. As long as we keep that protected, we keep our attention on it, that area that he wants to change will be changed. But the moment you quench it, the area that he's endeavoring to make a change in remains unchanged. Now, what is, how do you quench the Spirit? The next, the next phrase. Underline it. Despise, not prophesies. The word prophesying here is divinely inspired utterances. When the Spirit of God has taught you something, it's a divinely inspired utterance. When the Spirit of God has, has, has touched an area that He wants to change in your life because of behavioral doesn't line up with the with the with the with the, with the with the with the standards of God. He wants to change that, but you can quench that by despising it. Here's the point: the word despise means this: to make of no account. The word despise means this: to make utterly nothing of. The word despise means to regard as worthless. Lastly. It means to regard as nothing. In essence, what he's saying is simply this. When the Spirit of God touches an area in your life that he wants to make a change in, if you place no value upon what he has just showed you, if you place no value upon the touch that he's just touched your life with, if you place no value upon it and treat it as nothing, then you're guilty of quenching the Spirit and the thing that he wants to change in your life remains unchanged. The only way to bring change about, the only way to bring change about is for the Spirit of God to remind you, to teach you, to guide you into a truth. And do you place a value upon it? So much value that you protect that truth with all of your being and you keep it before you until you do something about it. All of us in this room have heard messages from Pastor or maybe Miss Sarah, maybe some of the other uh, ministers in this church, and something's touched your heart. If you're not real careful, what will happen is, is, is you'll treat it with such disrespect that you don't even write it down. Isn't it kind of interesting that when you want to keep something before you on a regular basis, man, you write it down, you put it on the fridge. You put it in the mirror, you put it in your daytime, or you put it on your computer. You tell your wife, because she'll always remind you of stuff that needs to be. But when the Spirit of God does touch an area in our life, and I heard these words on the inside of me, it's not always spectacular, not always filled with goose pimples, the slightest little touch that he brings to you about an area that you need to correct is an area you say, well, all right, that's the Spirit of God. 
guiding me away from fleshly things into a life in the Spirit, governed by the Spirit of God and the goodness of God, righteousness of God. So therefore, I'm going I'm to attend to this. I'm going to protect it until I do something about it. That's the areas you'll see change in. We can't be flipping about this. I'm going to say it again. When the Spirit of God touches an area in your life, don't disregard it. Don't treat it lightly. Put proper value upon it. Keep it before you until you do something about it. You'll not be guilty of the Spirit of God quenching you. You're quenching the Spirit. Not be guilty of it at all. You know, there's been times when the Spirit of God has checked us about decisions that we're, and we've disregarded Him, got ourselves into difficulty. There's been times where the Spirit of God has checked me about things. I know, I'll tell, tell this and we'll go. We got to go. Uh, you know, I'm 70 years old now. So everybody I talk to is talking to me about when you're going to retire, when you're going to retire, when you're going to retire. And uh, I actually started thinking about it about a year ago. And uh, I actually started going online and listening to videos about how to prepare for retirement. What do you need to do? I saw some things I didn't know. I wasn't prepared, that's for sure, some areas. So I got my mind on this. And uh, I really hadn't even said anything to my wife about it. And uh, over the years, you know, the Bible says that old men shall dream dreams. And uh, I, I, I've always dreamt dreams, but then when I wake up, I can't remember what they were. Anybody in here like that? You know, you, you know you dream something, but it has something to do with the horse. But other than that, that's all I remember about it. But I've, had, but I've had three dreams, and I'm going to tell you the third one. But I've had three dreams, two of them the exact same dream. About a year ago, here again, I'm thinking about this retirement issue. And uh, I dreamt, and I remembered it the moment I woke up, that I had, that I had left Rhema. And I woke up the next morning in my, at my house and knew I missed it. About four months later, I had the exact same dream. Left Rama, retired, got in my house the next morning. I knew I missed it. How many of you know, I better place some importance upon that little daily dad. Because I was doing it simply because I was agitated with some things. How many of you know, you work for somebody, the same people for 50 years, you're going to get agitated about some things. And if you get agitated, that's not always, that's not always the leadership that you're supposed to be living by in order to leave. Are right, you listening to me? And I knew the Spirit of God was telling me, uh-uh. No, no, no. So I had to adjust. I did tell my wife. We talked about it. But I said, honey, I'm not ready yet. It's not time. And she completely agreed. It's good when the Spirit of God speaks to us and guides us when we want Him to and we're looking for Him to. It's a whole other thing when He steps into an area in our lives where we're not looking for His input and He gives us some input anyway. Come on, guys. We need to pay attention to those things. So, Father, we just thank You today for Your goodness and for Your mercy. Thank You for the Spirit of God. We're not living life apart and alone but, Father, we have a comforter. We have the Holy Ghost that abides within us, our helper. We know what he's sent to do. And we're going to be more keen to allow him to do what you've foretold us that he would do as he abides within us. May we be more keen to him as he speaks to us about issues that we're not looking for his input in. May we be keen to recognize his voice. Give it a place within our lives. And not disregard it and treat it as worthless or 
or insignificant. Help us, Lord, through your word to connect these dots. Walk with the Spirit of God, understanding how he will function in our lives. Father, to God be the glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Hey, I want to thank you for watching the Reach YouTube channel. Be sure to like, comment, and subscribe so you never miss a powerful message, live stream, or church update. You can find out so much more about what's happening here at the church by following us on Facebook and Instagram, as well as our website, reachchurch.us. While you're there, you can also help support the ministry and our vision of reaching and equipping people. Thanks for watching and God bless.